You have been waiting for this, haven't you? Okay, look, before we start, there is just one thing I would like to get off my chest. Now, I'm perfectly aware there are some people out there who wouldn't give a flying monkeys about this locomotive. We've all heard the nicknames by now. Flying Money Pit. Flying Scrap Heap. The Little Blue Embarrassment. No, wait, sorry, I take that back. I take that back. He's fine. He's fine. I keep getting told off for saying that for some reason. I can't imagine why. Now, I will be perfectly honest in saying that I'm not exactly the biggest fan of this locomotive per se, but are you still here? This isn't about you. I told you you're fine. Just go away. I said, go away! Sheesh. He's in everything these days, isn't he? But to anyone who thinks that the engine's a waste of money and should have been broken up years ago, I will say this in its defence. If those people were pushing 94 years old, had been through 15 heart transplant operations, had most of their limbs replaced, and had damn near bankrupted any health service that dared to touch it with a barge pole, at least those people can sleep easily knowing that it's a criminal offence to have them thrown away and started again from scratch. Okay, I think I'm done. Let's talk about the engine, shall we? Flying Scotsman was one of the 52 Gresley A1 Pacifics built in Doncaster for the Great Northern Railway, later London and North Eastern Railway. Originally numbered 1472, later 4472, she was outshopped in 1923 for £7,944, or around 410000 in today's money. She was designed for passenger services on the East Coast Main Line, and in 1924 and 25, she was selected to appear at the British Empire Exhibition in London. Someone working for the LNER came up with the bright idea that the locomotive should be named after their famous named train, the Flying Scotsman, which was the London to Edinburgh rail service which had been in place since 1862. It was a stroke of PR genius. The British Empire Exhibition kick-started Flying Scotsman's fame and she went on to feature in many publicity events for the LNER. Scotsman was given a new type of tender, one with a corridor so crews could take over without stopping the train en route, conceived by Gresley himself. This allowed the engine to haul the very first non-stop London to Edinburgh service in eight hours on May the 1st, 1928. On November the 30th, 1934, Scotsman took a special light test train to a top speed of 100 miles an hour with driver Bill Sparshat at the regulator. This made her the first British locomotive to officially do so. Unofficially, people think City of Truro got there first, but we'll let you guys, the viewers, argue amongst yourselves. But anyways, the feat led her to earning a place in the land speed record for railed vehicles, making this another triumph for the LNER. Scotsman was rebuilt as an A3 on January the 4th, 1947. Her boiler pressure was increased from 180 to 220 psi, complete with improved superheating and a banjo dome. Before then, she had been renumbered twice, once under Edward Thompson's renumbering scheme when she became 502 in January 1946, and then in May the same year when she became 103 under an amendment to that scheme. Following nationalisation on January the 1st, 1948, LNER locos were increased to number 6,000, so 103 became the 60103 we all know today. After 1957, all A3 Pacifics were fitted with double chimneys and keel chap exhausts to improve performance and economy. However, this change caused soft exhaust and drifting smoke, obscuring the driver's view. This was remedied in 1960 by German-style smoke deflectors. In 1962, British Railways announced the withdrawal and scrapping of Scotsman, and she ended her service career on January the 14th, 1963. She was proposed to be saved by a group called Save Our Scotsman. However, the group was unable to raise the £3,000 scrap value at that time. In today's money, that would be more than 57 grand.
she was saved when former RAF pilot Alan Pegler stepped in and purchased her, with political support from Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister of the time. Pegler spent huge amounts overhauling her at Doncaster Works, as close to LNER condition as possible. This involved removing the smoke deflectors, the double chimney became a single one again, and she was repainted in her LNER apple green livery. Pegler then managed to persuade the British Railways Board to let him run the engine on enthusiast specials. So for a while, Scotsman was the only steam locomotive allowed to run on British mainline metals. During this time, she ran a number of rail tours, including another non-stop London to Edinburgh run in 1968, the year that steam officially ended on BR. During these years, watering points were disappearing. So in September 1966, Pegler purchased a second corridor tender, which was adapted as an auxiliary water carrier. Following another overhaul in the winter months of 1968 and 69, Harold Wilson's government agreed to support Pegler to run Scotsman in the United States and Canada to help promote and support British exports. To comply with US railway regulations, Scotsman was fitted with a cow catcher, bell, buckeye couplings, American-style chime whistle, air brakes, and a high-intensity headlamp. Starting in Boston, the tour faced problems, with some states increasing costs by requiring diesel haulage because they considered Scotsman to be a fire hazard. The only hazard I can see are the American politicians ruining everyone's fun, but I digress. Despite these problems, she ran from Boston to New York, Washington and Dallas in 1969, from Texas to Wisconsin and finished in Montreal in 1970, and then in 1971 running from Toronto to San Francisco, clocking up a grand total of 15,400 miles. However, the tour ended when Prime Minister Edward Heath's Conservative government decided to withdraw its financial support in 1970. Pegler decided to return despite this issue, but by the end of the 1970 tour, the money had gone, leaving Pegler in debt of £132,000, just under £2 million today. Flying Scotsman was put into storage at the US Army Sharp Depot in San Francisco, presumably to keep her away from the unpaid creditors and Pegler was declared officially bankrupt in the High Court in 1972. Having been left in the US, Scotsman's future was left in doubt. But in January 1973, steam enthusiast William McAlpine stepped in with an offer and bought Scotsman for £25,000, or £211,000 in today's money. After her return to Britain via the Panama Canal the following month, McAlpine paid for the locomotive to be restored at Derby Works. Trial runs took place on the Paynton and Dartmouth Railway that summer, and once again she began running further years of rail tours and excursions. In December 1988, she was then shipped over to Australia to take part in the country's bicentenary celebrations of Steam 88 festival. The organisers originally wanted Mallard to take part, but Mallard was unavailable, so Scotsman was a recommended substitute. During her Australian tour, Scotsman clocked up 28,000 miles, concluding with a return transcontinental run from Sydney to Perth via Alice Springs. This was the first time a steam engine had travelled on the recently built Central Australia Railway. Scotsman's visit to Perth saw her reunited with one of her old rivals, number 4079 Pendennis Castle. The last time they met was in the 1920s, and on August 8, 1989, Scotsman set yet another record en route from Alice Springs to Melbourne, travelling 422 miles from Parks to Broken Hill non-stop. This was the longest run by a steam locomotive ever recorded. 
In the same journey, Scotsman set her own haulage record when she took the 735-ton train between Tarkula and Alice Springs. Flying Scotsman returned to Britain in 1990 and continued working on the main line until 1992, serving the rest of her boiler ticket by touring preserved railways. To raise funds for the upcoming overhaul, she was once again returned to BR condition with the smoke deflectors, double chimney and BR Brunswick green livery, which caused a bit of a stir with angry armchairs, but you can't win them all I suppose. By 1996, the engine was facing another uncertain future due to the sheer cost of refurbishment. Dr. Tony Marchington purchased her and restored her over a three-year period to running condition at the combined purchase and restoration cost of £2 million. In 2002, Marchington had a business plan which included construction of a flying Scotswood village in Edinburgh to help create revenue for the locomotive's branding. Sadly, Edinburgh City Council turned the village plans down in 2003, and that September, Marchington was declared bankrupt. While still operational by April 2004, Scotsman ended up for sale again, but after a national campaign, she was purchased by the National Railway Museum for £2.3 million, including £415,000 from public money, a £365,000 gift from Sir Richard Branson, and £1.8 million from the Heritage Lottery Fund. In 2006, Scotsman entered the NRM's workshops for her most extensive major overhaul to date. Now, this was to have been completed in mid-2010 if all went according to plan, but the discovery of additional problems, a series of unfortunate events relating to the atrocious condition of the locomotive, the NRM's inadequate facilities to deal with some of these issues necessitating a move to Ian Riley's Berry workshops, and the press inadvertently exacerbating everything by giving the armchair brigade a mass of issues to wibble about, meant this deadline would be set back by more than five years. The issues are well documented elsewhere. But in a nutshell, the overhaul included replacing sections of the frames and the existing A4 boiler with the last remaining A3 one, which had been acquired as a spare back in the 60s. She was finally completed in January 2016, and testing began on the East Lancashire Railway that month. Her first mainline run from Carnforth to Carlisle took place on the 6th of February 2016, and she then ran from King's Cross to York on the 25th of that month. Flying Scotsman has such a broad appeal, because she was hitting the news almost constantly during 2016, albeit not for all the right reasons. It's not uncommon for fans of the locomotive to trespass just to get a glimpse of her, resulting in stepped-up measures from heritage lines and getting the local authorities involved whenever she pays them a visit. But the fact remains that she does still draw the crowds. The Seven Valley Railway's Pacific Power weekend in September 2016 attracted 15,000 paying people to the railway over five days, turning over more than £2 million in revenue. Sorry, Thomas. So whether you like it or not, Flying Scotsman will be making the headlines and capturing the public's imagination for years to come. But to those who still think she's a waste of £6.8 million to buy and overhaul, well, why not see her in person first, then see the crowds swarming around her, and then come to your own conclusions? Because having done so myself, I've already come to mind.